Hello everyone and welcome back to the Rideshare Hub. My name is Jacob Letman and uh, I'm on the channel. I'll be here from time to time. Dylan asked me to hop on here and share my insight and wisdom with you because I've been driving with Lyft for about two and a half years now. And actually I just checked. To be exact, I've given 1,693 rides, which means that there have been a lot of butts in my car seats. A lot of them. All right, so um, anyway, a little bit about me. I started driving for, I was teaching golf full time in Southern California, and I'm a passionate actor. So I decided to start pursuing my acting career full time, and Lyft was a perfect way for me to have a flexible schedule and still be able to make money anytime that I needed to. Um, so I drove in Southern California for about a year, and now I've been living in Phoenix for the last year and a half and driving out here. And uh, I'm still pursuing acting. I have an agent here and my agent in California still. So I travel back and forth. And then I drive for Lyft um, on the side to make money. And before we get started with today's video, I encourage you guys to comment, like, share this video, and subscribe to our channel so we can continue to create great content and bring it to you guys. All right, so today what I'd like to talk about are things that I wish I knew about Lyft before I started driving. Okay, so let's start with the sign-on bonus. Um, if you haven't signed up yet, make sure that you use our sign-on bonus that's in the description below because, right, the goal is drivers to make the most money and rideshare companies want to incentivize new drivers to sign up by giving them great bonuses. Um, so again, if you haven't signed up, we've got a sign-on bonus in the description below. You can use that and make some extra money when you're first getting started. Now, if you have been driving, a uh, great thing that you can do is you can share your own personal driver referral code with your friends, your family, your neighbor, the dude on the street that you just met, whoever, it doesn't matter. Um, to access that, I'm pretty sure what you do is you go into your dashboard, Scroll down, and I think it's called driver referral. You just click on that, and you've got your specific code to you that you can give away. Uh, I know that some drivers have that in their vehicles so they can, so that passengers who are driving who might be interested in driving can use that code. Um, I personally don't have that. I would just say make it look classy. So get a laminated sheet with that code. Uh, don't get a piece of cardboard that you found in the parking lot at Walmart and scribble it on there and put it in your back seat. Most likely it won't work. Okay, so sign on bonus, that's first thing. Second thing, there is definitely a learning curve when you start driving. I think in my mind I thought once I signed up and logged onto the app, there was just a billion people, okay a billion's an exaggeration, but there was just a lot of people who needed rides all the time. So I thought I'd just be busy 100% of the time. That is not the case. Don't get me wrong. There is a lot of opportunity to make a lot of good money doing rideshare. You just got to figure out what works for you depending on the area that you're in. So I'll talk about my experience. All right, so first thing. You can always make good money driving on Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights. There's always going to be people that are going out uh, to dinner with their significant other, going out to the clubs, bars. So there's always going to be more requests then. And the likelihood of prices surcharging are elevated at those times. So that's how I started out making my money were driving those nights. And, um, and then I got kind of burned out on that crowd. And so I tried to figure out how to drive in the mornings. Um, let me talk about my experience here in Phoenix. What I found, I live in a northwest suburb of Phoenix, and there are a little, lot of business people that travel to the airport um, in the mornings, Monday through Friday. So what I will do is the night before I'm going to drive is I will look at the scheduled pickups, and I'll keep refreshing that. I'd say about 75% of the time I can find a scheduled ride for the next morning with someone going to the airport. And 
people who have been driving with rideshare know that mileage is king when it comes to making money. So we're always looking for those long rides. Those are like, yes, I will take the long ride. Um, so it's about a 30 mile drive for me to the airport. And we'll say those rides typically started at like 6 a.m. So I'll get up, take some to the airport in the morning, drop them off. Roughly about 90% of the time in Phoenix, I will get pinged right away when I drop someone off for a ride request, picking them up at the airport. And so I'll pick up that person, take them, and, uh, and that kind of gets my day going. So I will drive until things die down, which are typically about, it's typically about 11 a.m. or noon for me here in Phoenix. And then uh, I have a number amount I'm trying to make each day. So I could probably hit about 80% of that number driving in the morning. And then I'll sign back on at about 3 in the afternoon and drive for a couple more hours to make what I need to make um, for the day. And that's pretty typical what I do. Now the other thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to find some go-to spots. So say I don't get a scheduled ride for the morning. There are um, there are car dealerships in the area that use Lyft solely for their customers to shuttle them around. So I will drive to those areas, hang out close to there, and typically within uh, about 10 minutes I can get a ride request from there, sometimes right away too. And so what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to find some highly populated areas, typically are great, or you can check and see if there's car dealerships in your area that use rideshare um, solely. You can hang out there. Uh, so malls are great, coffee shops, restaurants. Yeah. So w anyway, what I'm getting at is you're trying to figure out some go-to spots and scheduling that works for you during populated times so that you can create a set schedule. I will say, I'm pretty sure this is a general rule of thumb, afternoons, around the afternoon time, are the slowest. Evenings are the busiest, with Thursday, Friday, Saturday being the most busy, and then mornings are also typically busy for people commuting. All right. So we covered that. Let's talk about pros and cons of event driving and airport driving. Um, so my other thought when I first signed up was that, well, if I don't get a ride request, I'll just go to the airport and I'll get tons of rides because people are always flying. Well, so they have what's called an airport queue. And you will see if you're in the area of that airport queue, you'll automatically be entered into the queue and you'll see how many drivers are in front of you. I will tell you I have wasted a lot of time twiddling my thumbs and reading a lot of books I probably didn't even want to read waiting for ride requests from sitting in airport queues. I don't think it's worth it. I've been at John Wayne Airport in Orange County, California and then here at Sky Harbor in Phoenix and Unless the airport queue is less than 10 people, I will not sit in it because I've been in a queue where there's only been five people in front of me and it's still taken an hour and a half to get a ride. Sometimes you pick up that ride and they're not going very far anyway. So I see it as a con. The pros that people say about the airport queue is that typically you will get a longer ride. Yeah, whatever. I don't personally like it. Now let's talk about event driving. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about picking up from events. So when there's an event in town, let's say it's a concert or uh, stadiums, you're going to have a lot of people leaving the event at the same time, which typically will create a surcharge in pricing. And that's great, right? We want to make more money. Um, so that's the pros. Here are the cons. The cons are you're going to spend a lot of time uh, waiting to pick up your ride because there's a ton of people around. Sometimes it can be confusing as to where to go. Uh, take a deep breath, you'll figure it out. Typically there's signage of where rideshare drivers should go. Um, and then sometimes it's kind of tough to find your passenger, but you can always call them. Over communication is the best philosophy with that. Keep your cool around the big crowds. Um, yeah, so the pros are you can typically make more money with surcharges. The cons are it can be crazy. 
And by the time you pick up your passenger and take them to their location, typically the event has dissipated. So you can usually get one ride at a higher surcharging price. All right, here's what else I wish I knew. Some cleaning stuff. I wish I knew what to keep right away. Uh, the first thing is, so we always have to accept service animals. All service animals? Well, can't accept a service horse, obviously. That wouldn't work. Personally, I've probably only had like five in my 1,693 rides. Uh, but here's what I keep. So I'm really clean, really clean. I have a black interior, so hair sticks out like a sore thumb. So you could keep a small blanket um, for those service animals in your trunk if you want. And I keep these handy dandy multi-purpose cleaning wipes. Pretty sure I got them at the dollar store. But um, if a person does get out and there's hair in my car, I can use a couple of those pretty quickly to wipe down my seats and get the hair off and make it presentable for my next passenger. And then, you know what, sometimes you just get people who are hairy from animals that they have uh, or dirty. So I like to keep those in my car. I can clean up stuff pretty quickly. Here's the next thing, a handy dandy, looks like a plastic bag, smells like a plastic bag, but it's actually a puke bag. Definitely recommend keeping one of those in your car for easy access because although I've been fortunate enough not to have someone puke in my car, knock on wood, um, even though I've had some close calls, one New Year's Eve, I had to stop in the middle of the street get out, open up the back door, and pull, well, assist a lady, her head out of my back seat door so she could puke in the middle of the street. Very close call. Anyway, what I'm getting at, it's a lot easier to throw away a bag full of puke than it is to clean up your car. Even though you do get compensated if someone does puke in your car, nobody wants to deal with that. I don't want to deal with that. I love my car. I feel like it would be tainted if someone puked in it. Um, so I recommend carrying those couple of quick and easy things. All right, you guys. So that's what I wanted to cover with you today. Again, I'm going to be on the channel from time to time. We're going to be bringing you a great comment. Uh, thank you for watching today. If you did enjoy this video, please give us a big thumbs up and make sure to subscribe to our channel. And then also, if you want, you can comment below. Let us know what rideshare platform you drive for how long you've been driving for, where you drive, and any other pertinent information that you want to share with us. Uh, please feel free to follow me on social media. My Instagram is at Jacob Letman. Nope, at Jacob dot Letman. That's it. Letman is L-E-T-M-A-N. And uh, hey, this has been another episode of Rideshare Hub. We'll see you guys next time.